There are few eras as exceptional and consequential as this one we're currently living in. There is the advent of fire and language, money and democratic government, Aristotle's laws of identity and non-contradiction, the printing press, the industrial revolutions, sort of destruction of feudalism, though these days the richest 1% seem to me like new age lords and nobles, and the niches or niches of the working people, though lacking in their rights to strengthen as official unions, seem like contemporary guilds, and bursting through the caste system of sorts, despite proof of so many so-called American dreams fulfilled, can feel impossible when you haven't done it, and the way through seems unwritten. And I wonder, really, since the Civil War, at least from an American perspective, when have we seen, no more than just an American perspective, but specifically from an American perspective, when have we seen a time as radical and revolutionary as these? When since the tumult related to World War II have we seen so much global radicalism and revolution? Nationalism continues to spread like a global fever, so much so that the March and April 2019 edition of Foreign Affairs, titled their theme, The New Nationalism, and the publication's editor says nationalism has, quote, come back with a vengeance, close quote. From Brexit to the fighting between Israel and Palestine, from Russia's lust for Crimea and more to the, quote, ascent of strongmen in states such as China, the Philippines, and Turkey, as Jack Snyder puts it in one of those foreign affairs articles. The global nationalism trend, though, is just one fascinating strand of the intensity throughout the world lately. Vox reported this weekend that New Zealand released the first ever well-being budget on May 30th. So happiness is starting to matter more than ever. The Economist reports that according to India's telecoms regulator, subscriptions for mobile broadband services more than doubled between the end of 2016 and 2018. People in severe poverty, which were once kept from accessing the internet, increasingly are gaining access, especially to make and watch videos. As of 2017, according to an article by The Verge, the aggregate time people spend watching videos on YouTube's homepage has grown 20 times larger than it was three years ago. Some people, like Caleb Kane, according to a New York Times feature on the YouTube vlog, fall asleep to YouTube videos at night. The New York Times adds with 2 billion monthly active users uploading more than 500 hours of video every minute, YouTube's traffic is estimated to be the second highest of any website behind only Google.com. According to the Pew Research Center, 94% of Americans ages 18 to 24 use YouTube, a higher percentage than for any other online service. With YouTube in the midst of a dramatic rise, forget how this might impact network television. How will Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu compete for viewers in the 18 to 24 demographic? Will some of the biggest vlogs become Netflix vlogs? 
What does this mean for the Maddo Hannity style political commentary we got used to? Meanwhile, did you know public support for left wing policymaking has reached a 60 year high as reported by Vox? So just like there was a consciousness revolution in the 1960s, from the politics of that decade to the increased depth of Bob Dylan and the Beatles style music, something distinct yet comparable is going on now. Donald Trump, a former reality TV star, is president of the United States. The first president without any meaningful political experience. And he's on the verge of becoming the only the third president in US history to be impeached. To be sure, his attempts to obstruct investigations into his suspicious ties to Russian interference with our elections, mixed with a plethora of other disconcerting, abusive, and criminal acts, including violation of the Constitution's Emoluments Clause, make him far more impeachable and criminal than Clinton's lie about oral sex and the law on which President Andrew Johnson's impeachment was based was ultimately deemed unconstitutional. The political response here is likewise historical. As Bloomberg reports, there are more current and former governors and members of Congress running this year than there were total candidates in any party primary in the last several decades. Politico's David Siders writes in his headline and subtitle, Trump backlash sparks avalanche of 2020 policy proposals. The sheer multitude of policy proposals is staggering. He calls it an unlikely renaissance of ideas and says, for brooding Democrats, the primary field's position papers are an emotional refuge. This summer's dreamy must-reads. And those old tried-and-true conventional ideas, such as electability, which Trump destroyed in the 2016 election, read Bob Woodward's book, Fear, for example, after example, after example, after example, of Republican operatives dismissing Trump after each of his missteps as unelectable and Steve Bannon's consistent rebuttals to them, all undergoing further demolishment as mainstream media darling, the former Vice President Joe Biden, seems to flaunt his aura of unbreakable electability with the utmost cockiness in a way that is shattering support that he might not have lost eight years ago. Consider the following quotes Politico documented this weekend. It's not just a flip-flop. It's like a double axle flip-flop. And he's not even nailing the landing, said Democracy for America chairman Charles Chamberlain, whose group has supported Warren and Sanders in the past. Look, he's running for president, Marianne Williamson, the self-help author running in the Democratic primary, said of Biden's changing position on the Hyde Amendment on CNN on Friday. People came up to him and said, you're really behind the times on this, Joe. You've already got a problem with women, all that. So he changed his mind. And Politico published another article poking more holes in the electability concept and demonstrating why we can really now call it, and please excuse my profanity on this one occasion, this would be one of the very few instances in my blogging life where it seems like the appropriate word, bullshit. The article is why you're wrong about the Democratic primary, the wild history of presidential campaigns has a lesson. Nobody knows anything. The 1973 Supreme Court case on abortion rights, Roe v. Wade, this year is being systematically and methodically challenged by a number of state legislatures. ABC News says their, quote, news Supreme Court contributor, Kate Shaw, a law professor who regularly writes about reproductive rights, explained the new spate of abortion restrictions, acknowledging that they present an 
unprecedented attack on one of the country's most controversial laws. Since Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973, these are absolutely the most extreme laws that have been passed, Shaw said. Over 40 prosecutors, including state attorney generals, signed a statement pledging not to prosecute these laws. In other words, we're in the midst of a major legal face-off. What does it mean to live through such an age? I think it means there's a special chapter, or maybe even a series of special chapters reserved in the history textbooks of the future, which will be taught to posterity. I believe that furthermore, this means how we act in these very particular times will be extremely consequential. While those of us who are deeply embedded in social media communications and politics are more energized than we've been in nearly half a century, it would seem, and while access to the internet is growing exponentially, especially on already massive sites like YouTube, that doesn't mean much to those who live outside our niche, our niche, our click, our Twitterverse, if you will. That doesn't mean they necessarily care. To illustrate, as someone said to me recently, while the crowds on social media are calling for Trump's impeachment, myself included, that does not necessarily represent the majority or plurality. Not that I suggest this is an argument against impeachment and why it's a losing political move. Rather, I'm thinking of Massachusetts Senator and Democratic presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren and what she said at the recent MSNBC town hall event. She said, quote, if most of America isn't with you, then you talk about it. You make the argument and then you listen. You start with what you believe is right, then you go out there and fight for it. My bottom line then is this, ladies and gentlemen, however revolutionary the times may be, however liberal the plurality of Americans may be, even if internet access is opening up for the severely poor, nationalism continues to be on the rise and there are traps like the U.S. Electoral College gerrymandering and a Supreme Court, which is a product of those. I mean that the revolutionary fervor is alive and well on both the left and the right from different angles. And if we want posterity to look back and say this age, not just of revolution, but of revolutionary debate was won by those who care about things like abortion rights, not just internet access as a means to distract the poor from the miseries of their poverty, but to help them grow intellectually and economically. And those who care about happiness for all, those kinds of things, we need to make the most of these times. This is not a time like the mid to late 1990s when things seemed so well and yawning and apathy and lethargy didn't seem to come at such a cost. Like the democracy of ancient Greece and Rome, like Aristotle's discovery of logic, there's a lot we can either embrace or lose for who knows how long under the sand inside some time capsule.